Uh, I was honored to be invited to talk. Uh, and so thank you very much again for the invitation. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what people uh, have to say um, about my presentation. So I'm going to um, share screen. This should switch us to the, does everybody see the uh, shared screen? Okay, so let's do the slideshow. All right, so everyone should have just the slideshow there. Is that does that look right? Okay. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, full disclosure: um, I am not a person of color. Uh, I am white, and this is uh, I recognize that uh, my position as a white person in talking about race is one that. Um, has a history of people presuming, whites presuming that they have the answers, that they um, uh, have all the insights, that they know basically black bodies, bodies of color, that they know people of color. Um, and so uh, this is something that uh, I try to keep aware for myself um, while I'm uh, doing this work. Um, it's obviously always an ongoing process. Um, and I'm also coming from... Uh, the background of phenomenology and Husserl, which is about self-awareness. Uh, so um, while Husserl's work and phenomenology in general has its critics, and those critics are often quite on the spot, um, there's also a lot of rewarding work uh, that you can do with phenomenology. And so um, it's with this notion of the uh, the rewards that we can gain from phenomenology that um, uh, I'm hoping to bring this uh, to the question of race. Um, so uh, some of the things that I try to maintain um, for myself as awareness, um, first of all, like I said, my own position, my position in a history of sort of presuming and subsuming um, other bodies. Um, there's also sort of, especially in more recent work, but also there's a whole history of this, this risk of what's called specularization, um, where white, white gazes um, sort of look at not only white bodies, but uh, sorry, black bodies um, or bodies of color, but also sort of um, uh, study the suffering of bodies of color and and that kind of, um, and um, uh, black bodies in general or black bodies specifically, especially if you're talking about black white racism in the United States. Um, and then there's also this issue of the uh, neutral vantage point, which is usually the white vantage point, um, which is invisible to whites. And so this is, again, something that I'm trying to keep um, visible for myself. Sorry, my cat jumped off my lap. Okay. All right, so uh, I'm working on a paper um, that is going to be published in a volume called The Emotions. Um, I think the subtitle is Phenomenology, Psychopathology, and Psychoanalysis. Um, and I agreed to write a paper on uh, the emotions of racist encounters. Uh, so more full disclosure, I am neither an expert in emotions uh, or the philosophy of emotions, nor an expert in critical theories of race. Um, so the, the reason that I uh, suggested doing this is because um, uh, my main area is taking Husserl's phenomenology and demonstrating how it's applied or apl applicable um, to a lot of different areas outside of not only Husserl's work, but outside of phenomenology in general. And so I saw this as an opportunity, first of all, for me to learn, um, but second of all, to see if... Um, there, there might be a contribution that Husserl could make um, to uh, uh, questions about race and racism. So um, did a lot of readings, still not an expert, right? Um, the, the paper um, coalesced around these three texts here. So I'm looking at Alia Al-Sajiz, um, Phenomenology of Hesitation from 2014, um, Linda Martin Alcoff's Visible Identities from 2006, and George Yancey's Black Bodies, White Gazes from 2017. That's the second edition. The first edition actually came out in 2008. There's a couple of related texts in the background. Um, also, G published uh, the SPEP co-director's address, and she returns to this notion of hesitation. It's in the background. I don't really cite it uh, too much uh, in this work. Um, Martin Martin Alkoff uh, publishes um, published uh, the phenomenology of white identity. Um, 
in uh, an anthology called Racist Phenomena. And I actually refer to that quite a bit because I think there's there's a lot that can be taken there. Um, and then uh, I published something called The Levels of Embodiment, a host early in analysis of gender and the development of eating disorders. Um, and that's where I have first published uh, the levels of Husserlian um, constitution um, that I think is applicable well beyond um, uh, well beyond sort of just his texts. All right. So um, when in these three texts, the three main texts that I that I um, uh, pointed out first, uh, I noticed a recurring theme um, that actually were were all sort of going in different directions, but they all in a, sort of had this sort of centering. And this theme was suturing and seamlessness, right? So you see suturing with two in two of these texts, or suture or sutured, um, and you see seamlessness in the other one. And seamlessness is sort of the opposite of suturing, right? So if something's not sutured, then it appears seamless, right? Um, and so I see these as working together. They're all sort of um, pointing to similar uh, uh, directions. So with Martine Alkoff, she starts by, uh, or she's, it's actually in the middle of her text. Um, she's discussing this film, Suture, that came out in 1993. Um, I haven't watched it yet, but I've uh, discovered that it's available on Tubi. So if you want to go watch it, it's on Tubi. Um, she's uh, talking about this movie in the context of a discussion of colorblindness that she's addressing. So in the movie, um, and I'll just give a very brief sketch, um, there are two brothers. Uh, one is white, one is black. And the white brother, Vincent, decides to kill his black brother, Clay, and uh, stage it as his own death so that he can then go off and do something else. So he basically wants to kill himself, but he's killing someone else in his place. So there's a car bombing. Clay survives. Um, and, um, but Clay has amnesia and Vincent's identity papers are on Clay. So Clay believes that he's Vincent. Now, Clay, uh, to the viewers of the movie is still a black man. And, uh, and so to the viewers, this seems like an odd sort of substitution for Vincent, who's a white man. But in the movie, um, people are standing there with photos of Vincent and looking at Clay and saying, oh, it's you're identical. You look exactly the same um, as you did before the car bombing. So so Clay ad adopts this identification as Vincent and everyone around him adopts this identification of Vincent. Um, so there's this uh, there's multiple types of suturing happening in there, right? So one is the suturing of Vincent's identity onto Clay, right? Um, the second is one that's brought up in Martin Alkoff's analysis. Um, and this is analysis done by somebody else where uh, there's this Lacanian notion of suture, um, uh, which where a subject sort of inserts itself into this meaning gap. So there's this gap that the su subject sees and the subject inserts themselves in there. And so then they, um, in a sense, suture themselves uh, into a meaning. Um, so that overlaps with this suturing of identity. Um, but Martin Alkoff also sort of in a in sort of a, a side mention um, refers to what I think is actually a little bit more important. And that is um, the viewers or our own suturing into a racist society. So her overall um, issue is the fact that the movie presents colorblindness as sort of what the viewers should seek, right? That we should, in a sense, reach for this world where we can have two bodies, a black body and a white body, and we can consider them interchangeable, right? Um, and she's taking issue with this because on the one hand, um, uh, while this is possibly a far future ideal, um, the way race functions um, now is much deeper than um, sort of this sh skin shedding type of, of image. Um, so uh, uh, it's ignoring basically this depth that is sort of both embodied, but also sort of a social historical depth that she's pointing out to uh, pointing out in her text. Um, so this is the issue. This is what she's talking about with with regard to suture. So we have this movie suture. There's there's these multiple dimensions of suture with Martin Alkoff. Um, so here's the here's the I'm not going to read a uh, length, lengthy text, but I'm putting them uh, up in case. But this is where she sort of says um, there's a problem with this um, sort of uh, setting up racism as just simply an issue of, of skin that can be shed um, or not shed. So Yancey also brings up the notion of suture. His is um, has a lot more depth to it, um, but it's uh, actually kind of scattered through his text. Um, 
For him, white identity is what is sutured. So uh, in the sense that we can talk about how white identity is itself constructed, even if it doesn't think of itself as constructed, this is where he's bringing in that, the notion of, of sutured. And he identifies it as sutured through um, the, the white placement of itself as sort of this innocent and neutral position that must cast off sort of the, the blackness of black bodies that are criminal and dangerous um, um, and that kind of thing, right? Um, so, uh, so the suturing is like basically an invisible suturing that whites don't see because they think of themselves as sort of in a neutral position. They are, um, you know, simply just being subjects and they're just being themselves um, and not recognizing that um, their successes, their abilities to do many things are already resting on um, not only historical suffering, but also contemporary suffering, um, as in, for example, being able to walk into a department without being followed, as opposed to being walked into walking into a department store and um, being presumed to be a criminal. Um, so uh, for Yancey, white folks need to be unsutured. And this is not a, um, a, a neat um, uh, metaphor where sort of when the wound has healed, the doctor sort of gently removes the sutures. For Yancey, this needs to be in a sense a ripping open of the sutures. So it's meant to be sort of this painful opening where the wound becomes visible, right? Um, even in its pain, right? So, so whites need to, in a sense, recognize their own implications in um, especially, so his focus is on black, white racism in the United States in the, in the racism that um, has led to the United States where it is. Um, so this, this opening needs to happen and it needs to be continual, right? Um, and it's meant to be um, uncomfortable um, and painful. So here's uh, some references by Yancey. As you can see, he sort of, he mentions this at the beginning, sort of in his introduction or first chapter of his book. And then it comes in very much later. Um, I think it's in chapter seven. So he brings up this notion of suturing um, sort of scattered in the text, but I find it quite productive. And I think, uh, I think it, it has, there's a lot there. Um, so also she doesn't mention suturing. She actually mentions um, this notion of seamlessness. Um, and she's talking about the seamlessness of, of white identity, which I think is sort of the flip side of what Yancey is saying. So he's talking about how uh, whites are sutured, but they don't see it, right? They don't recognize it. And so for al Saji is in a sense describing that, that invisibility of the suturedness of white identity, right? So it appears seamless. It appears sort of like as if it's um, just simply its own position. Um, so this seamlessness um, or this, this uh, we could say, sutured identity that appears seamless um, presumes its own neutrality, right? Presumes uh, it's sort of like centering in the world, its ability to sort of gain knowledge, but it also um, invests the perceptual activity of whites, right? So it, it, it affects how whites perceive. Um, and this is something Yancey is arguing as well. And actually, Martina Alkoff also points this out, that um, when uh, someone is in a specific position, especially a position of white privilege, one will see danger, one will see criminal, one will see um, something to watch out for or to avoid um, when they see black bodies or bodies of color, they will see shiftiness or, um, and this is, this is something that appears to whites as simple perception um, or simple raw emotion. And the analyses, all of these analyses are pointing out to the fact that it's actually highly constituted emotion and highly constituted um, uh, perception. And uh, so analyses need to be done to sort of demonstrate how this perception actually sort of makes itself look like just sort of a simple act of perception, where uh, in sort of in the background, it's actually been constituted by these historical and social and traditional um, sort of matrices. Um, so here's a citation from al Saji where she uses this notion of the seamless um, and uh, and uh, is how this this gaze this gaze sort of presumes its own ignorance um, and its own in innocence. 
Okay, so here are citations from um, each of them, uh, Martina Alkoff, Yancey, and Al Saji. Where each, so again in these same texts, where they each point to how um, perception itself is invested in. Um, these power structures, especially racial power structures, right? Now we can also apply this, I would say, to uh, notions of gender, um, ableism, uh, things like that, where we again sort of see, say, certain bodies as fragile, certain bodies as um, unintelligent, certain bodies as as incapable or as limited, right? We can even see our own bodies in this way or feel them in their in these own bodies, and so a lot of work, in fact. Uh, um, uh, Al Saji cites um, Maris Iron, um, Iris Marion Young's uh, "Throwing Like a Girl" as an early text that sort of identifies how, like, there's this sort of self-limiting of embodiment um, because it's already been filtered through um, certain knowledges and certain um, sort of meaning structures. Okay. Um, so we have these racist structures in perception and emotion. We have them in uh, social institutions, traditions, history, and so on. Um, and what you find in a lot of uh, work, and this uh, you find this not just in critical theories of race, but also in um, uh, work on gender and that type of thing, that there's sort of this dichotomy between sort of the social and the individual, right? And there's lots of different takes, right? Like there's takes that, you know, the individual is always an only social, right? Um, there's other takes much older, usually that the social is just simply a bunch of individuals. Um, but uh, most of these, um, uh, most of these uh, projects working on sort of analyses of gender and race um, are identifying sort of uh, how the individual might absorb social meanings, how the individual can also contribute to social meanings, um, and so on and so forth. Now, in these texts, we also find that there are references to sedimentation so and habituation, so like formations of habit, right? Now, these habits kind of go both ways, right? Often habit is uh, collapsed into sort of simp uh, simply discussions of perception, right? So habits of perception or something like that, right? Um, but we see each of these um, authors, Yancey, Martin Alkoff, and al Saji, referring to sedimentation, habitualization. Come in. Yeah. Oops. Uh, Mm -hmm. Happy, happy. To, Good. To, to do Hello. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, um, sorry, I thought someone was had a, like a, an immediate question. Um, uh, so uh, this notion of sedimentation is also sort of um, a, a running theme in each of these uh, texts. And each of these uh, uh, authors um, have phenomenology either in the foreground or the background of their work, right? Um, and so. Uh, when you're doing work with Husserl, um, sedimentation is actually understood as a, as a bit of a separate level. So I, I, I recognized that in a sense, we might have in these texts at least, and possibly in others, so multiple um, levels going on. And if the multiple levels are sort of collapsed into just the two, sort of the social and the individual, then that actually can lead to some confusion or it can make um, sort of the, 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 seeking a certain kind of outcomes, such as anti-racist outcomes, more challenging because we have multiple things going on in each level. Um, so uh, this is where Husserl's levels of constitution come in. Now, I was actually remembering this morning that um, I was my one of my early formulations of these level constitution was actually presented at NASAP uh, as uh, and I was invited to speak at NASAP in 2018, so about five years ago. So this is a long time coming. Um, I, I'm actually on sabbatical right now and working on a book to actually really lay this stuff out. Um, but I've given a couple of presentations, but one of the, I think the very first or one of the very first was at NASAP in, in five years ago. So I'm gonna run through uh, the levels of constitution in Husserl's work as I see them. Um, and then I'm gonna run through them again uh, to demonstrate sort of how um, there are racist structures at each of these levels. Okay, so this is a lot of information and I'm gonna go through each step. Uh, uh, if you look right in the middle, active constitution, 
right? That is actually where most people think of Husserl. Like, so he, if you've read Ideas One, which is what most people have read, you have sort of this constituting subject looking at some kind of object, right? You're looking at Husserl's inkwell or something really dull, right? And you're, you're constituting it as a unit, right? So active constitution is actually where Husserl is most often sort of pigeonholed. Um, but all of these levels are extremely evident in his work, even if he never sort of says, I am working at these five levels. So this is that's kind of the 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 work that I'm doing right now is to sort of say, look, they are in the background of his work almost all the time. Um, and he definitely like, uh, and Husserl scholars will quickly admit this, even though they might not be working through all of these levels rigorously, they'll admit that he has lots of different levels through with it, with through which he works. So now let's go to the bottom. So the primordial of the hyaluronic flow is basically the flow of sensation. Um, he refers to them as primordial sensations. He also uh, sees at this level primordial associations. For him, primordial associations are connections of similar color with similar color or connection with sound with sound, that kind of thing. Um, now, um, uh, all of the authors that I'm working with on critical theories of race, um, or at least definitely Martin Alcoff and Al Saji explicitly say that while there can there is racist perception, there can also be perception that's just simple perception, right? So picking up the pencil and feeling the pencil in my hand is not the same as seeing a black body as dangerous. So there can be there can be um, immediate sensations that are sort of invested in racialized structures. And there can also be immediate sensations that are just simply immediate sensations, such as if you suddenly hear an explosion outside or something like that. So all of this is at the primordial or hyaluronic flow. The next one up is where we find um, those sedimentations, those habitualizations, habit forming, right? So passive synthesis and hyaluronic flow, those two bottom levels, they work very closely together. For Husserl, they're both considered the passive realm, right? Um, but we, you know, we can actively create uh, habits, but then they become part of us. So, I mean, if you think about learning how to uh, dance, a certain dance, right? At first you're like, okay, right foot here, left foot there, right foot here, left foot there. And you're, you're thinking about each step, but once you've practiced it, then you don't have to think about it. In fact, if you think about it, you kind of interrupt it, right? Um, and so once it's become a habit, then you can you can think about refinement, that kind of thing. Um, so I also grew up playing the piano. When you're first learning it, you're playing it note by note, but then after a while, you're paying attention to the fluidity between notes. And then after a while, you're actually sort of very automatically playing it, maybe thinking of even higher level um, things. But if you start thinking about note by note again, that actually sort of messes with the playing of the piece, right? It sort of like makes it clunky again. So passive synthesis is something that's, uh, all of this is happening all of the time, and they're all sort of working with one another. We already talked about active constitution, that's sort of when, uh, that's sort of subject relating to objects as wholes, it's very much in the foreground of our awareness, whereas passive synthesis, which we just talked about, is very much sort of in the background of our awareness. Now, most of the times in, in much of philosophy, we sort of have the social realm and it's sort of this huge sort of clump of the social realm. And in Husserl, at least, there's at least two levels of, of intersubjectivity that he refers to fairly regularly. One is sort of the one-on-one -on -one or the one in small groups. So it's the I and thou, um, but it's also sort of me with small groups. It's, it's me with sort of known small groups uh, of people, right? Um, and that's a different type of relationship than my relationship with society as a whole, right? Um, so the second one, that, I mean, the top one, so intersubjective community is that sort of notion of society as a whole. That's what we're talking about. Nations, we're talking about communities as wholes. We're talking about, if you um, are, are thinking like Judith Butler or Foucault, that notion of discourse, right? It's functioning at that highest level of intersubjective community, whereas it's functioning actually all the way through, but like that's the level where it resides, right? Um, whereas in interpersonal intersubjectivity, which is the level just below that, that's where we have one-on-one -on -one, um, encounters. Now, whatever's functioning at the uh, highest intersubjective level, so discursively, is clearly often fed through the interpersonal, right? So like a belief that women should be thin, right? Is then fed through individuals. And then you have high school girls teasing each other about being fat or something like that, right? And that then, so you take this, this general notion from society about how women are supposed to look, fashion magazines, et cetera. Then it gets fed into interpersonal intersubjectivity where girls tease each other, um, 
or they're uh, trying to bolster each other up, you know, it can be, they can actually act against it too, right? Um, then it can feed into active constitution, how I see my own body, right? Then it can feed also into passive synthesis, uh, how I habituate certain eating habits, things like that. And it can also fe feed into sort of lowest level sensation. I can feel fat. I can feel sluggish. I can feel thin, right? Um, um, and it can also feed upward. So all of these levels, um, they feed into one another. They don't have, you don't have to pass through each one in order to, to get to the others. Um, so uh, one of my, uh, uh, an excellent example um, is implicit bias, right? So implicit bias will usually happen at the level of intersubjective, intersub, uh, interpersonal intersubjectivity. So I'm calling it IS1. So a person does or says something implicitly sort of makes a, you know, like rolls their eyes or something like that. Um, in a way that is uh, dismissive, right? Um, I may not even notice that, right? Or the person who's being dismissed may not notice that. So it doesn't even sort of register at the level of active constitution, but it may end up being part of passive synthesis. It may affect how that person habituates their body, right? Um, it may affect how they feel sort of emotionally um, whenever they encounter that person or similar situations again. So a lot of things, especially when it comes to race or gender, um, can actually, in a sense, sort of bypass act bypass active constitution and slide into passive synthesis so that we have habits or recurring emotions or that kind of thing um, that we're not sure why are there. Um, and then we go through therapy or we go to support groups or in the 1970s, there were rap groups where people talked about women, talked about like being women. Um, and these things then enter into active constitution, right? But they don't enter as like new things. They enter as things that have always been there. They just weren't something that were at the foreground of awareness. All right, so uh, this is the same same set, but now we're we're talking about them with regard to uh, racism, right? So the racist perception that we see, especially Yancey and Al Saji talking about, but uh, Martine Alkoff talks about it as well, is already happening at the level of primordial um, or hyletic flow, and that is sort of these racist structures from higher up feeding into perceptions, so that a white person can see. Um, a black body as dangerous or criminal um, or suspicious or something like that. This then feeds into um, certain types of embodied habituations. So Yancey's um, now I would say famous example of the elevator example, which actually is in a movie long prior to that, um, the Spike Lee's Higher Learning. If anyone has seen that movie, um, there's a there's a moment where uh, a black student gets on the elevator with a white student. She immediately tugs on her purse. Um, and so it's just it's beautifully exemplified already in Spike Lee's movie. Um, and and uh, so this kind of habit, right, this habit of tugging on the purse or the habit of uh, locking the car doors when a black body is seen on the sidewalk or crossing the street. All these are examples that Yancey uses. Um, these can be carried out without active awareness, right? These can be carried out where one doesn't even notice one's sort of in the middle of their thoughts, but they just cross the street or they just lock the doors or they just tug on their purse. And one of Yancey's main arguments is that this sort of this, this need to protect whiteness, to protect white bodies is embodied into white bodies, right? So that these habits um, become habits that are uh, associated uh, or that become sort of triggered by black bodies when they appear, right? Active constitution now is going to be how, uh, I mean, basically how one constitutes one's own body and how uh, that how one understands one's body as integrated with race and gender. But as mentioned before, there are certain aspects that uh, that don't necessarily come to awareness, right? So I may think of myself as an extremely self-empowered woman, um, not realizing that my eating disorder is actually sort of this, this form of um, of uh, sort of gender domination that I've invested into myself, right? So I may not become aware of that even if I see myself as a very powerful woman. Um, uh, the two uh, intersubjective levels also, so face-to-face face, face, -to -face encounters are at the level of IS-1. Um, this is where implicit but also explicit uh, racist encounters can take place. Um, and then at the level of intersubjective community, so the highest level, this is where we have um, sort of history, we have documents, we have traditions, we have policies, we have discourses that in a sense uh, 
affect sort of general meaning structures um, that uh, that are in the background of a society as a whole. Okay, let me check the time. We started at 1.30. All right, so I'll go quickly through responses and then we'll just see if there's um, any questions. Um, so each of each of the authors that um, I'm talking about um, has different ways of responding to. So, I mean, in a sense, all of these texts are written in order to um, seek a way towards anti-racism, right? And uh, now Yancey's project is partly to say, look, simply sort of saying I'm an anti-racist is not enough. There's all this other stuff going on. Racism is, is, is embodied, right? So that means, you know, making a cognitive decision that I'm not going to be a racist um, is a good step, but it's not enough, right? It is not a rival, as he calls it. So Martin Alcoff, this is now in another text, um, the one that I uh, pointed out as a, a related text. Um, she talks about sort of this moment of crisis, right? Where one recognizes that what one thought was sort of like, it was sort of a natural attitude, what one sort of believed was the case, um, becomes challenged in one way or another. Um, and it can be very subliminally, it can be very uh, um, sort of, uh, sort of in your face, um, whatever it is, she calls it sort of a crisis. There has to be this moment of crisis. And this then leads into her discussion of bracketing of what she calls the natural attitude of whiteness. So I think that, that this bracketing then becomes sort of this moment where we take um, the presumptions, and this is sort of the hard part, the presumptions of neutrality and that kind of thing, set them aside and really examine sort of uh, what these presumptions can do. Yancey, in his text, um, refers to ambush, so this moment when even what he calls a good white um, will recognize that sort of racist thoughts sort of just like will slip in in between what they think to be themselves as anti-racist individuals. So he refers to, um, excuse me, um, he gives multiple examples. He refers um, in one case to, um, uh, I can't remember her first name, uh, last name is Lazar, and she is a Jew white Jewish mother of um, what he describes as mixed race children. Um, and uh, the black friend of one of her sons is stopped out front of our house um, by police because he's driving a nice car, right? And so she, she exclaims, but this is unbelievable. And her son looks at her and says, um, angrily, like this happens to me all the time, right? I'm, you know, a black kid and I'm driving a nice car and, you know, black kids aren't supposed to have nice cars. So it's got to be stolen or drug money or something like that. And so she who has these boys and who lives in this family. So there's this closeness already there. Obviously she's, she's not living with sort of like explicit racist, um, uh, belief system, but at the same time, sort of this presumption of the the neutrality and fairness of the police, right, remains sort of uh, sort of a, a, a white presumption that she's maintained even in spite of her living situation, right? He also refers to uh, Tim Wise, who's an anti-racist um, theorist, uh, and Ra Wise describes a scenario where he um, is getting on a plane, sees two black pilots in the plane, and the thought crosses his head, God, can these guys even fly a plane, right? And Wise realizes that you know, all the work he's doing, right, this thought still passes through his head, right? The, you know, like, blacks can't fly, they're not capable, right? Um, and uh, so, so what Yancey describes is this is a moment of ambush, right? Whites can be ambushed by that sort of racist structure that's still in them, even in spite of much anti-racist work, right, cognitively and, and sort of even habitually. So his the, the response then is for him, he says that whites need to tarry. They need to, they need to stay, stay with that moment, right? Um, and then there's also th this, this tarrying has, I think, alongside it, this notion of unsuturing. So he talks about tarrying separately from unsuturing. Um, I think that they uh, are actually sort of uh, intertwined with one another. Also, she uh, talks about hesitation. Um, so the, the paper that I, uh, am, that from which this, talk is coming, I have a, a long section on, on also G's uh, notion of hesitation, which I think is actually a, um, somewhat problematic, not in its face, but in, um, in uh, exactly what she means by hesitation is not clear in the text. Um, and so there's all these different uh, ways that she describes it that end up sort of challenging one another. So it's sort of, uh, there's a bit of, um, um, slippage in how she's um, describing hesitation, where if you look at certain definitions and other definitions, they actually can't really connect. 
the other the other issue is that what she's describing as hesitation, which she ultimately sort of says is a an ontological ground and phenomenological opening, is actually akin to what Yancey describes as ambush and Martin Alkoff describes as crisis. So we think of hesitation as that pause, right? That, that moment where we sort of have to sort of look at what's going on. But what she's actually describing as hesitation is that moment that leads to the pause. So it's the prior moment. Um, and she says hesitation can't be willful. So she's not talking about that like moment where I sort of make myself stay with it, um, even though she says we do need to make ourselves. So, so there's this problem with the choice of term as well. Um, so I suggest that uh, I'm not trying to replace the terms that these authors have um, have uh, introduced, but I suggest that, that maybe there's um, sort of a genus above them all, just this notion of interruption. And uh, also she even refers to um, hesitation as a, as a type of interruption. Um, and so we have this interruption. It can come in the form of ambush. It can come in the form of crisis. It can come in the form of, of hesitation, as Al Saji describes it. So that whatever it is, it's a rupture. It's a break in. It's it's a recognition momentarily of the sutures, right? Um, and then what we have to do next is we have to pause, right? Here we have for Martin Alkoff, we have bracketing. We have uh, with Yancey, we have tearing and we have unsuturing. Um, and with Al Saji, we have basically this moment of responding to uh, the hesitation, right? So um, so I'm, I'm basically saying, look, with each of them, they have these two moments. They call them different things. I think they should all be called different things because these are different types of moments, but they can, can possibly be understood under these two general headings. And I'm not trying to say these two general headings are the only thing that's going on, right? But that um, with regard to these texts, we have these two moments going on. Um, so my sort of final conclusion in the article is that um, we have the we have to be open to interruptions, right? We have to actually um, make ourselves or allow ourselves to pause, right? And we have to continue. So we have to doggedly pause, right, over time, right? Because if we do it just once, then we feel like we've arrived. Yay, we're anti-racist now. Um, and that's where we slip into and don't recognize the fact that we still have sort of white or racist habituation, comportment, embodiment, presumptions, things like that. Um, so uh, uh, this is the a citation from the article that that is going to come out um, that we need like not only interruption, not only pause, but we need sort of like this continual pausing. We need to allow it to be uncomfortable. We need to allow it to be painful. Right. But we have to also stay with it. We have to allow for the emotions that happen with it. Um, and we have to just continue it over time. All right. I'm going to stop here. So I thank you. Um, and I, again, want to thank you for your attention and for staying when there was the bit of a snafu with regard to um, mixed up websites. So thank you. Thank you for the excellent talk. Uh, my job now is uh, just to moderate uh, the questions. Uh, basically, if you have a question, uh, put up your hand and I'll call on you and uh, then the floor is yours. Uh, really, that was an amazing uh, talk. There was very, there was so much there to discuss, uh, and it's so very important that we discuss these things right now in our particular yeah. situation. Especially now, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so who who has uh, the fir the first uh, question or thought? It's like being in a class where there's only right. like three students and everyone's like uh i'm not i'm not ready <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have a question <laughs> don't look at me please <laughs> oh, yeah um well if if no one does i i guess i just have sure. uh, uh could we this is a super naive question <laughs> um can we define race what is what is racism uh, okay, so race is a, a thing yeah. that has been defined, um, but it's defined culturally, right? So there yeah. are different cultures that define it differently. Um, so, uh, I mean, almost always there's a historical moment where someone, usually someone in a position of power or central position in some way, is identifying other groups of people 
as raced, right? Um, and th there are moments in history, so some I can't remember exactly, but um, Martin Alkoff does a really good job um, in pointing to moments in history where these notions come up. Um, and there are others as well, of course, who've done this as well. I think uh, um, Lewis Gordon also identifies sort of moments of history where um, sort of this notion of race becomes itself conceived, right? So it comes out of certain, certain languages and certain cultures. Um, um, but it's usually pointing to another culture that one is afraid is going to um, take over or infiltrate or um, mix, right? God forbid. Um, and so then this notion, this term becomes employed as a way to sort of separate, right? As a way to distinguish and then also to sort of maintain power for the position uh, that's wanting to be in the center, right? Um now, uh, I mean, there, even in the United States, like certain groups of people were identified as black who are no longer identified as black, including the Irish, right, um, and Italians. So, uh, so it's a it's a very fluid notion, but obviously also extremely effective, right? Because it's then employed against people, and it affects their livelihoods and their lives, right? Um, and uh, in in all sorts of different ways. So I don't know if that answers because I, I didn't really sort of say what race is. I just sort of said what the term race has done. Um, uh, but I, I don't know if that's at least a starter for for the question. That's that's a excellent starter. Thank you. That clarified it. I was just looking for like, is it like a, a natural category? Is it a social construct? Because yeah, and I, I mean, you answered it's, it's, that. You that's, answered that. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So I mean thank the you. short answer, the short answer is that it's a social construct that's set up to appear as if it's a natural category. Awesome. Thank you. Uh and I'm not going to monopolize the time. Lauren here has a question, so I'll just hand it over to Lauren. Hi, Professor Rod Meyer. Hi. Um so I have other things that maybe I can email uh, to continue the conversation because I don't want to again uh monop monopolize either. But one of the questions that popped in my head in thinking with the different levels you've drawn out from Husserl is my mind, um, what came to mind is thinking about a lot in our contemporary moment, the um, significance of representation in media, mm -hmm. right? So thinking about significance of representation in media and the work that that does at the, uh, the level of the, um, I know I can say this quickly, the IS2, the intersubjective, oh, yes, yeah. right, with um, the other sort of references I remember you making is, right, that national discourse or, like, um, discourse in academia with Judith Butler, people like that. Yeah. And noting, too, that, right, um, all the levels are, they play off of each other. They don't necessarily go in a linear order. So I was wondering if um, you have thoughts about, right, thinking about the... Um, significance of active constitution, both for consumers of media who are white, um, mm. but also for, um, right, and thinking through also the sense in which so much of the um, Black American experience, U.S. experience, is saying, right, our value of our experiences is not premised on suffering, right, that our, the value of what it, what Black culture is, is not that we get together in our spaces and talk about white supremacy or how much white people <laughs> hate us, right? So yeah. also thinking, right, the work of popular media yes. as, right, I'm thinking of randomly Beyonce's recent crossover to country, right? <laughs> I had this conversation about yeah. what audience does she have in mind with this? But um, the sense in which, right, that kind of media representation, rap, hip hop, especially during the Cold War has been the face of like, America, U.S. itself that contends with this white supremacy, in a sense. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about uh, about this, um, these levels of constitution, specifically with active constitution, is opening up that space of um, those interruptions that you mentioned with um, the word you use with interruptions, but the alcohol, not necessarily crisis, but like pulling the veil up. You know, in a moment that's not um, where my mind goes to of like a bad or negative experience right. per se. Um, so I was just curious. Sorry if that's super nonlinear and like a bunch of jelly thrown at a wall. But I just wanted to hear your thoughts about that. <laughs> I love the image of jelly thrown at a wall. Um, so, all right. So um, 
I, I think this is an excellent question or a series of questions. So let me know if I go astray in responding. Um, so uh, I think that the level of the level of IS2, so that top level, so that level of discourse, right? Um, that has often been set up as, you know, like, so in Butlerian terms, like it's he the hegemonic discourse, right? There's the, it's the, it's always sort of this negative imposing, um, you know, and even Foucault and Butler say there, there are counter discourses, but you can't get out of the discourse, but there, there can be counter discourses. Now, some of the work that I've done, um, actually the second book that I published is actually arguing that there can be counter discourses that can, in a sense, originate outside of discourse from embodiment itself, sort of from like original sensation and then enter into discourse. So they can't like just remain outside of discourse or perhaps they can if I just have sensations that I never share, right? But um, but even I kind of name them for myself. So they become at least somewhat discursive. That's that, Now I'm astray. Um, in any case, um, there that, that higher level of, of sort of discourse, but documents and things like that is also can also be a moment for its own ruptures, right? So um, your your description reminded me of the movie American Fiction, which is, you know, it, it is a type of discord. I, did you see it? Um, oh, no, then no, you have to, because you are actually talking as if you had seen it. Um, but it basically is a story that um, is is about black experiences and it's it's basically constantly arguing that black experience is not always uh ghetto drug related pain right um and so the the premise of the movie is um this author who wants to write about just experience in general and he's getting turned down because it's not black experience right so he writes this um this this parody of black experience, which is very ghetto, and it just follows all the memes, and then get picked up, and everybody loves it. And he's like, you don't, you know, and it, so it goes on and on. It, it, it snowballs. Um, but the whole the whole movie is to sort of demonstrate like how white culture now, in its sympathy of being good whites, is eating up these stories of black suffering, right? Sort of living in the ghetto, having to overcome that type of thing, as a way to sort of be good whites. Right. Um, and not allowing blacks to sort of just express themselves as people. Right. Um, and so like some of the most poignant moments for me in the movie were um, the the author's um, mother is suffering from Alzheimer's. My mom has suffered from Alzheimer's. So I'm, I'm watching the Alzheimer's storyline. Right. Um, and this is, I think, what the author is wanting to see is like, look, mothers with Alzheimer's. This is something you know, it's that it's not just my brother was a, you know, a gang member problems. It's mother has Alzheimer's problems. Um, and so to go, return to your question, sort of these big media moments can both be insidious in continually presenting the same story, right? That then become both part of our habits, but also part of our active awareness, right? Um, but they can also produce interruptions, right? They can also produce those moments where like, and well, we have to be ready for them, right? Like I have to sort of say, ooh, ah, that white person that looked like me and I do that too, right? Um, and that means I better rethink, you know, like how I am as a white person, right? Um, so I think that, that that sort of level of sort of the bigger, broader, you know, policy changes have effects, right? You know, even when, you know, Roe versus Wade made a huge difference. The re, you know retraction of Roe versus Wade made a huge difference. Those are big policy decisions, but they also have like lots of counter you know arguments as well, right? So I don't know if that sort of uh, uh, addresses your question, um, or or did I did I bypass it? Did I miss what you were? No, what I think that's great. What came to mind um, too was the genesis of the um, Me Too movement, where um, and also the pres presidential election of Trump. I remember watching um, interviews with people who were talking about um, sort of being with other people when the election results came out um, in mixed settings where um, in particular, there was a huge response from women, like the Women's March on Washington. And I, I will never forget, I, I'd have to find the source, but someone turning to the people around him of like, I just can't believe this is our country. And that women of color were around them and said, this has always been our country. Welcome. Yeah. The water's warm, right? So, yeah. um, I, yeah, absolutely. You definitely addressed uh, the question. So, thank you. No, thank you for the question.
Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, I have another, just to keep the conversation going a bit. Uh, so Marx uh, said uh, in a, somewhere, um, you know, in issues like this, where there's huge social conflicts, ultimately this is going to come down to and force decides. Uh, and Malcolm X, quite a few years later, said, yeah, we're going to overcome racism by any means necessary. Uh, and by any means necessary, M Malcolm X did mean, yeah, we'll shoot them. Um, quite explicitly, we'll shoot the cops. Uh, he's when the dog attacks you, you attack back. Uh, you kind of mentioned the desuturing de de and interruption. These are lovely terms. Uh, how far are we willing to go down, uh, down this towards the Malcolm X road, or do we want to go more along the Martin Luther King Road to actually enact substantive change, like uh, to race is just uh, maybe, yeah, that's my wonder. <gasps> All right. So uh, you're talking to a person who's a big fan of Malcolm X um, and uh, uh, and also a fan of Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, so, um, yeah, I, uh, excellent. Excellent. Um, so uh, what I teach Malcolm X um, to my intro students um, often. And one of the things that I point out to them is if you read him very carefully, he is willing to go all the way. But he's basically saying, why shouldn't we go all the way when everyone's gone all the way against us, right? So if you're gonna if you're gonna lynch and shoot and do all of these things to us, why shouldn't we fight back, right? When all we want is to vote, and I'm saying we as Malcolm X, because clearly, I'm, you know, but but the right to vote, right? The right to be able to be treated as equal citizens, right? And so when he says the ballot or the bullet, he's not saying I want to shoot bullets. He's saying I want to vote, right? But if you continually refuse to let me vote, I'm willing to fight for it. Um, that said, on you know, on the flip side, Martin Luther King Jr., there was an awful lot of violence on that side too. And I'm not saying that Martin Luther King was perpetrating violence, but that that um the the third step in that preparation for um nonviolent uh nonviolent um protest is actually preparing yourself for violence. Um, so like I, I learned this when I went to the Martin Luther King um, uh, Museum in Memphis. Um, I, I figured it out. But um, but like it's not clear in his letter from Birmingham jail. He names them. Right. And I thought, oh, you go and meditate for a while. And then I was like, no, 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 no. They practiced. They practiced. They sat at counters and had people spit on them and pull them down and yell at them and things like that so that they could practice being nonviolent. But it was being nonviolent in the face of severe violence. Right. So so both of them were facing violence. Right. It's just um, uh, so. So how far will you go? I think they were both going the same distance. Right. They were both, in a sense, facing death um, for what they were doing. They were just both doing it uh, through different means, right? Um, so I don't know if that satisfactorily answers um, you. How far will I go? I don't know. I'm I'm uh, I'm an academic, right? I live my safe little white life, right? Um, but uh, uh, recent uh, events make me um, think about uh, how far I will go. Yeah. So it's something, it's an open question for me right now, but it's it's a live question for me right now. Yeah, and this this talk is being recorded, so probably not a good idea to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe, yeah, maybe but, take out that little segment there. Yeah, yeah, no, but I like uh, I'm reading uh, how to blow up a pipeline right now, and uh, <laughs> that 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 book um, details wonderfully exactly like on all on many of the civil the peaceful civil rights marches, there were black uh, people at a distance well-armed, ready to stop uh, any counter-protests. Oh, uh, okay. And okay. that's, yeah, like, and the, the, those were the ones that Martin Luther King, <laughs> some of them that he was leading. It's like, yeah. which is, I think, fascinating. And yet your answer was great. Um, yeah.
Thank you. Uh, but provoke other questions. It's yes. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> let's get to them. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go with Eric first and then uh, Lauren, if that's all right. Uh, so go, Eric. Thank you, Lena. Great presentation. I'm sorry I missed the start here, so I apologize. My question was kind of overlapped. Um, I, I really like the category. I came in with the categories that you were kind of doing in terms of the different sort of structures, and and I was reflecting on, and I I think it's in ideas too, where Husserl talks about um, being born in a family where there's sailors, but you're not by the sea, and you still have kind of like. Um, uh, you, you still have some like the language and the culture of like sailing without actually being there. And it, when you, you talked about implicit bias as your category, that stuck in, with me like, wow, here's how language that we're born of often without being even conscious or intentional about is part of the way that we orient often without our understanding. So that, that example for me, you know, even though Husserl wasn't talking about like race explicitly, like this is a, a great sort of structural way of talking about some of the issues with with implicit bias that you know are going on in our society that people want us to sort of resist even kind of talking about. So I know you had a kind of a structure there kind of talking about it. And so I just figured I'd get your kind of take on that in terms of how that sort of fits into the structure, the sort of language over generations being part of a culture, you know, you know, to Lauren's question about like the media system oftentimes without us being aware of it. So thanks. So so yeah, um I mean in a sense that that scenario right sort of like uh we're a sailor family but we don't really talk about it but it's part of like our diction maybe even right um is that would be sort of an overlapping between the top two the is2 and the is1 so the is2 would be sort of the actual structure of diction right like the the actual sort of different types of uh, vocabulary and things like that um the is1 would be the fact that this is how my father speaks to me right you know and this is how my mother speaks to me and this is how I speak back to them right um and so that the sort of like those one-on-one -on -one, uh, scenarios. But I mean, they. this is why like uh, when I present this, people think they're separate and they, they can't be separated, right? So like if I'm in a very paternalistic family where you never speak up to your parents, right? You like never, you do not face them. If they tell you something, you say yes, sir. And then that's it, right? Um, that is going to be then embedded into my body, right? And it's, and I'm going to take it out into the world, right? And so then I have a boss who talks to me and I'm going to say, yes, sir, right? And I'm going to do um, whatever. And so it becomes sort of, so in a sense, it's this meaning structure, you know, children should not talk up to their parents, right? Brought into IS1, sort of, this is how my father treated me, embedded in a sense into how my, my body and how I speak, right? And then taken back into the world. So then reifies um, sort of this, this world. Now imagine it happens like in the 1970s or 1980s, I go to a therapist, right? And I talk to the therapist about my relationship with my parents. Um, and then uh, it becomes part of my act of awareness that these habits that I have were actually sort of results of how my parents talk to me or something like that, or that my habits uh, that I have are part of sort of a larger social system. And so therapy in a sense can open it up. That doesn't undo it, right? But it can open up the moment for possibly trying to create new patterns, right? Not all patterns can be undone, right? You know, we all want to be different parents than our parents were, right? Then we're parents ourselves and we hear ourselves speaking the words that our parents said to us, right? Um, and so those things were so deep that no matter how much we promised, I will be exactly, you know, I will be opposite of what my parents were. Uh, and I, I don't wish that my parents were actually very good parents, but there were certain things I wanted to change. And yet I said things that my parents said to me that I said I would never say, right? I have said them to my son, right? Um, and um, because they're embodied, right? Because they're 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 sort of passive. Um, so. Uh, but that moment of active awareness. So this is what sort of the, the what Yancey especially is saying is this moment of awareness is awesome. <laughs> Great. But that's not it. You haven't arrived now as a non-racist just because you became aware of sort of racist tendencies. You have to, in a sense, sort of keep it open. You have to be aware of your participation. You can't sort of say, oh, I no longer believe that whites are better than blacks. Therefore, I'm no longer racist because as a white person, I continue to not be followed in department stores, right? And there's nothing I can do about that, but that is a white privilege. I need to remain open to sort of the pain that that's causing others and the pain of my own sort of like 
discomfort with that, right? In addition to other types of, of privileges. So um, again, I think I may have gone a little bit astray, but hopefully that, that answers, um, answers your question to some extent. Yeah, thank you. And go ahead, Lauren. I'm not sure how useful this will be. So perhaps if I'm okay to email you, um, this could be a, a, a longer conversation possibly, but um, your use of the word interruption reminds me of how that's central to Mariana Ortega's work and in between in particular. Um, and what I appreciate about um, Mariana's in between book um, is, uh, and I should preface this by saying I'm a phenomenologist who focuses on Edith Stein's phenomenology. Okay. Um, but uh, what I appreciate about how Ortega, um, as a phenomenologist, is thinking specifically about immigration experiences, but in the sense that interruptions are a constant interruption, um, that reflects the way that these social structures um, that someone has to navigate, right? I think about how people sometimes refer to the experience of code switching, right? Mm -hmm. People of color who live in a white dominant society um, right, they code switch, they act differently in different contexts, but that Ortega's analysis is really great in terms of thinking it, I don't think she puts it quite this way, but the way that I understand her is that this constitution, this, there's a multiplicity of constitutions at an individual level, right? So I'm not sure how far Husserl is useful for thinking about that, but insofar as thinking with Husserl about this, um, not just located in the individual, but also in society external to the individual, that um, there are these um, interruptions thought about in Ortega's sort of way. Um, I don't know if that she would be a good conversation partner with with filling out that word or if it's useful to you at all. But I will say that when I was listening to you, that's the first person that came to my mind with that term. Excellent. No, that's really helpful. And I'll go back. It's been a long, long time since I've listened to Ortega. I mean, since I've looked at Ortega's work. So I think I will be going back. Yeah. And there's a new uh, collection of essays published in 2019 where her, George Yancey is in that collection. Um, and maybe she's she uh, has developed it a bit more because that was what, 2016 or something like that. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to flag that to say that um, in my mind, I was like, uh, wait, how does this term going to work with right? Ortega's sort of analysis there. So let me, let me answer that question quickly. So um, I think, uh, especially when you have someone like Judith Butler, who talks about sort of the hegemonic discourse, we tend to think of sort of that uh, IS2, that top level as being itself seamless, whereas there are contradictory, like, discourses within there. And anyone who's functioning within multiple discourses going to have to do something like code switching, right? So like if I appear as a black person or as a as a woman or or more, right, then I'm going to be putting on different hats. I'm going to code switch depending on my scenario, right? Um, and, but in order to learn to code switch, I would say that there probably is often a moment of interruption first, right? You know, like there probably is a moment of interruption where I'm like, oh, oops, I, I shouldn't be talking this way. I need to switch to this other mode, right? Um, and I, now I'm thinking of um, uh, there There was this lovely, it was a celebration of um, W.B. Du Bois' um, uh, it was like the the publication, like the hundredth public, the hundredth year publication of his, um, the souls of black folks. And there's that moment where it's like the first time I realized I was black. And so there's this commemoration where there um, were all these current uh, people, uh, uh, African Americans from the United States, um, but not just there. I think also Britain as well. And they are all like in little two to five minute scenarios where they describe the first moment they realized they were black. Right. Um, so the interruption is it can go for anyone, right? Um, where it becomes this sort of recognition of a society that we thought was um, sort of holistic or, you know, um, or unified in some way, right? Um, mm -hmm. And that there isn't, right? So when you immigrate, you already have sort of flagged, okay, I'm gonna be dealing with different cultures here and stuff like that. But when you're at home, you don't have that flagged, right? 
but then let's say you're a, a gay living in a, you know, a, a very conservative household, you're going to code switch as well. Right. Um, and there are going to be moments where you realize that you didn't code switch in time and those can be dangerous moments. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so I, I think this notion, these notions of interruptions with, um, Ortega, but also these notions of um, code switch can also fit under, as long as we don't uh, fit under the sort of the scheme that I'm talking about with Hustrel, as long as we don't presume, presume that each level itself is sort of homogeneous mm -hmm. and that there are sort of breakages between them um, or within them, right? Um, and I'm not trying to say, I never meant to say that like each level within itself is just very simple and there's sort of a really basic structure. I'm giving it in a talk, right? So it has to be kind of simple, um, but there can, there's certainly are breakages and um, in the book that I'm writing, that's sort of breaking this down, there are, there are most probably within each level, sub-levels within there, right? Oh, yeah. That you can do sort of phenomenological analyses of. Um, but I would say that um, um, the sub-levels don't have to be necessarily hierarchical. They can also be sort of like lateral as well. Um, and, and, what uh, I, and what I, um, and the last thought um, I forgot to share about Ortega and why it pegged in my head um, that ruptures moments or those interruptions where you're thinking with Alcoff. Um, mm -hmm. the, the other part of Ortega is those, um, and I didn't mean to introduce another term of code switching, but the other element of Ortega's analysis is that the immigration experience, yes, but certainly um, where you have some authors that are writing about in childhood or the sense of, right, that the, um, seeing that uh, national uh, I2 level as a seamless whole or as yeah. a, as a, um, has never quite been the case, um, uh, right? Where in childhood or early experiences, you sense something from your parents and you get the talk, right, during childhood. But um, what I appreciate about Ortega is, and why I think uh, I, my mind continued to go back, is with Alcoff, with this crisis experience, Ortega um, frames that initial before habituation phenomenological experience of that interruption is a, she frames it as a traumatic rupture. So she uses a different terminology than Alcoff would. And, a, and in your presentation, you were thinking about, right, the white experience of that crisis moment, because um, it being something that's tracing towards solutions at that point. Um, but um, I, I also hear you and um, the more all these terms can get super messy. Um, and adding more terms is probably not helpful at that point, but um, certainly thinking about uh, even when we say black experience, that in and of itself at a IT level is not uh, seamless or, right. you know. It presumes seamlessness, usually from yeah. a white perspective, right? It presumes right. the seamlessness. Um, right. No, and actually, so I, some, some, the more recent work that I've been doing, um, especially when I, I was publishing or working on my second book was on trans experience. And a lot of trans theorists, especially in the nineties and two thousands were picking up Ortega's work with regard to border crossings. Um, so this was a, a motif in, in trans scholarship um, and basically sort of troubling this notion of, of uh, border crossings because um, the, the border crossing sort of metaphorically was a border crossing between male and female or, or blending those two, but also um, the trouble of actually literally crossing borders as a trans person. Right. Um, and, and so there, there are like, if we're talking about sort of traumatic ruptures, um, like it can happen in so many different ways, right. When it comes mm -hmm. to sort of embodiment and when it comes to, to race embodiment, gendered embodiment, um, trans embodiment. So all of these different ruptures can happen in so many different ways. Um, and, uh, like, so this, this notion, the notion of rupture was actually quite common, um, in sort of the 1990s. Um, I think there was, there's a lot of Derrida, right. You know, uh, and that kind of thing, but I, I still like this notion of rupture. Right. Um, and I, I think it's, uh, I'm not trying to resurrect Derrida here. Um, but I think that the, uh, God forbid, um, uh, but, um, but I think, um, this, this notion of an interruption without, um, <laughs> taking it too far. Uh, they can be tiny, they can be huge, um, but there's the, often it's this break that like sort of leads to new identities or reformed identities or 
all of the above, right? Um, so I think, yeah, so I, all of these terms are helpful. I don't think it's, I, yes, it messes the pot, but I think it's 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 helpful to recognize sort of this um, interpollination and this cross-pollination of, of these, uh, of different um, different theoretical uh, projects, right? Because they're, they're all sort of pointing to similar types of experiences. Excellent. Uh, let's get, uh, Jim's been waiting here so very patiently for um, what I think will be our uh, last question uh, for the day. Uh, so Jim, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I appreciate your presentation. I'm not sure I have a question so much as I would like to share some of my thinking and reaction and then have, invite you to comment on it. Um, and I've got sort of a setup um, to this, and I'd like to offer, in fact, a, a request that you put the slide back up with the five levels of um, uh, constitution. And an example that I find very helpful, um, and, and my interest, I'm an adult educator, and my interest is helping adults. Is this, you know, is this good? The one with race, or do you want the other one? It doesn't matter. Okay, so there you go. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm an adult educator. I'm interested in helping to interrupt people's learning processes who are on a path to becoming less racist, who, who recognize that they are racist and you know want to move along or to debrief maybe a, a reaction that they catch themselves with. And one of the things, one of the examples that I find helpful in, um, particularly with whites, um, comes from, I believe it's Desmond Tutu's book, Without Forgiveness, There Is No Hope, or something like that. But he describes uh, flying in an airplane, encountering turbulence, and he he catches himself thinking, my God, I hope there's a white pilot up in the cockpit. It's similar to the Tom Wise uh, or Tim Wise uh, comment that Yancey cites. Okay, I'm I'm not familiar with that. I joined the the presentation oh. late, but anyway. So, what I find really useful about these levels of constitution, um, as I you know practice myself, um, you know, sort of debriefing my own lived experience using phenomenological tools, I find um, sort of the epistemology of Michael Polanyi very helpful. Uh, very briefly, you know, he. He basically says that everything we know is the result of the integration of focal awareness with subsidiary awareness. So when I look at this five levels of uh, constitution, I see a structure and a very useful tool for understanding subsidiary awareness or or the context for anything so if i catch myself having a reaction like oh my god i hope there's you know a, a white pilot up there i can analyze you know the background to that thought um you know oh so the at the hyletic level oh i'm having this anxious reaction i'm ner you know because my body's being tossed up and down in this airplane um i can so, I mean, what you've done is you've given labels and languaging so that people who are trying to learn and reflect and be less racist, they can realize, oh, I'm, you know, I'm interpreting my experience this way because of, in fact, I think in the book, Desmond Tutu talks about, you know, his own upbringing and why he has those beliefs, you know, that come from the intersubjective community level and of course, anytime you bring, um, you know, maybe he reflects upon something growing up that was sort of a critical incident that contributed to that. So now that becomes, that comes into his focal awareness and it has a subsidiary, it has a context that could also be looked at in a recursive way using these kinds of levels. So, uh, you know, I have a very kind of pragmatic interest. I, I thank you for, you know, sort of unpacking and labeling these levels of constitution. And I wonder if you would like to maybe just reflect or comment more on the utility of, um, you know, from sort of a, a self-reflective learning standpoint of, uh, you know, decreasing racism at the individual level and maybe in the small group level as people can come together and talk about these things. 
Uh, so, uh, well, thank you. First of all, thank you for your patience uh, while I was answering other questions. Uh, and also thank you for this, this question. So I, I understand you to be asking sort of like practically, but also pedagogically, um, how might these levels be uh, useful? Um, how might they be employed? Um, so uh, so I've actually written the one article that I, that I cited where I've actually sort of the first introduction of these um, is... Um, uh, with regard to uh, the, the psychopathology of eating disorders. So it's actually talking about how eating disorders themselves as a psychopathology um, uh, appear at all of these levels, right? So that there, there's basically sources and, and aspects of an eating disorder at all of these levels. And so therapeutically, um, you can't just sort of... Um, identify a problem with parents as the only problem, right? That may be the main problem. That may be your entry point as a therapist, right? And you work through that, but that there's that um, problems with parents, which would be that. So IS one basically um, uh, feeds into uh, a lot of other aspects, right? But then also I've developed as uh, an individual, my own habits with regard to food, my own habits with regard to my body, and those need to be addressed too. So um, so the, the most superficial sort of first answer would be is when we're looking at something quite complex that sort of invests us like an eating disorder or like uh, racist presumptions, we have to recognize that we can't... Um, just find it, right? Find the source and dig it out, right? And be done. Um, but that actually it's in a sense um, sort of infiltrated into us at all levels, right? And so there might be obvious um, uh, entry points in sort of changing oneself. So if I grew up in a racist household, so the N word might be common for me or something like that. Maybe I start with that, right? Identifying when I feel the need to use it, recognizing it, sort of reflecting on why I'm using that word and trying to not use that word, right? So like in a sense, start with the explicit aspects of, of how I might express the racism. But then like, let's say I develop a habit of never using the n-word again um if i think i've arrived then um first of all yancey has a lot to say about that right and i think a lot of other critical theories of race theorists of race have a lot to say about that but um if we're looking at this uh, at the these multiple levels we could sort of say okay well that was just you know maybe is1 maybe that's active uh, constitution but there's a lot of other levels still going on right there's a lot there's a lot of different ways that this um is sort of in me right um and uh so to to keep going right to keep um to keep finding and keep staying aware because they also crop up right this is the ambush that Yancey talks about right they can they can pop up um in like Desmond Tutu's moment of anxiety god i hope it's not a black pilot i hope it's a white pilot they know what they're doing um that's a that's a that's basically an is2 meaning that has gone all the way down into my deepest anxieties right and so to recognize that i can't just sort of you know find a little tweezer and tweeze it out, right? But that they're going to be there. And I have to just, in a sense, be aware of them to recognize them and to, um, to stay with them to recognize sort of my own implications in these structures. Um, does that, um, does that uh, answer your question to some extent? Well, very much so. I mean, I think you're illustrating the, the utility of these five levels and and the necessity of addressing more than one, you know, and, and multiple ones, and in a recursive way. So I mean, you you just triggered something for me recently. My wife, acute, or well, she wondered whether maybe I was um, anorexic oh. uh, because I've lost, you know, a lot of weight recently, and which I'm very happy about. But now she's worried, and so I. You know, for me, just to react in a very simplistic way and say, oh, no, you know, it's because of this or whatever. No, it, there's and and it's an opportunity, you know, perhaps using these, you know, two or three of these levels for my wife and I to have a more enriched dialogue about, oh, well, what where what's your experience been with anorexia? How have you seen that in people? I have in my own history, I have. You know, it means certain things to me, and there are uh, telltale, you know, signs that could indicate a person is, 
you know, anorexic and I don't, that's why I don't think I am, you know. So I, I you know, again, from a learning and, and in particular a group learning perspective, I just find, and I, I really want to thank you. I think the, I'm going to be using these five levels uh, awesome. because it, it's a way to unpack our experience and, uh, you know, sort of learn uh, from our own reflection as to what could be going on. Yeah. and how, how I could improve or how I could help others improve. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 And again, on behalf of all of NASEP, uh, thank you for this incredible talk. Um, You're all stuck. Uh, this was such an important, this is such an important topic for right now. Uh, and in the history of phenomenology, race like sometimes Heidegger is included in this, in the history of phenomenology. And uh, the question takes a very nasty turn as soon as you introduce a Nazi into the, uh, yeah. so it, it's lovely that you're doing this and that you're doing this now. And it is lovely. The way you're doing this is really phenomenal. I learned a lot. Uh, it was a great talk. So thank you so much. And thank you for your time. Uh, yes. uh, well, and with that, I'm going to. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for for their patience with when we had the Zoom uh, confusion. Um, so I'm so glad that it ended up working out anyway. So this is this is excellent. Um, and anyone who has further questions, I know Lauren said you wanted to uh, text me or not ex email me. Um, I'll put my email uh, down in the chat or would you be able to send it out? I'll just put it in the chat real fast. Sure. And um, also, this talk has been recorded. It should go up on the NASEP YouTube page uh, within a week or two. Um, if you're on the NASEP mailing list, uh, you will be sent a notification of that. Uh, I will also make sure that I get this to you, Lanai, uh, if, and it'll be on our Facebook page uh, for future uh, conversations. Uh, and there's a lot to talk about here. So with that, I'm going to draw this uh, wonderful talk to a close. Thank, Thank you so you much. Again.